I think uh, the the presentation by uh, Professor Grace is very uh, kind of informative and also thought provoking, especially uh, <laughs> regarding the predominantly kind of ideology uh, shaping our understanding or lack thereof of each other. Uh, and also, the, one of the survey you give actually from the American side is more kind of representative. But for the Chinese side, although you said this is there is a large number of respondents, but most of them, I suspect, are actually the self-administered. Uh, so uh, I think they are more active engaging online citizens. So I suspect, although I think the score is quite low, but I suspect that if you kind of conduct a real representative survey, the number will be even lower. Uh, so this actually misunderstanding of each other or this lack of knowledge of each other, I think the most interesting findings of your uh, study is the past analysis. Because normally when we think about, talk about people or the national image of each other, we lump together as if this is one single concept. But if you look deep into the components of what is China or what is your perception of China, you can easily divide it into, for example, Chinese culture, Chinese tradition, Chinese people, or Chinese government, or Chinese product. So in, uh, if you look across all these components, you will find out the only maybe most negative components of this is the Chinese government, or the, or the ideology part of it, which is what you try to kind of look at. Uh, so I think although we suspect the political, ideological, or cultural uh, factors contribute to people's perception of each other, but I think you the research you present really provides some concrete uh, evidence to really substantiate which part it really contributes to the most to our understanding or lack of understanding of each other. Uh, I think maybe because I come from a journalism or mass communication background, although you talk about this ideology as predisposed ideology, but I think I highly uh, uh, suggest all these ideology also are the results of people's exposure to media's coverage. Uh, regardless whether you pay attention to follow uh, closely to New York Times, New Yorker, or not, actually you are pretty much kind of bombarded by all kinds of media's coverage. Uh, so we know there are two uh, well-known kind of facts. One is most of people's kind of knowledge, if you haven't been to a foreign country, come from uh, the media's coverage of that country. That is one, one thing. Another thing is, in not, uh, both in the United States and in China, the media people, normally they are the value enforcer or the ideology flag carrier of that country to be able to really reinforce whatever ideology or identity of that society. So if you put this together, you will find out uh, the, you, although you talk about this liberalism uh, or maybe nationalism in China or liberalism uh, kind of be in the United States, but you can find out actually this is reflection of the mainstream media's frame uh, about each other or whatever we should understand each other. So I, I think it would be more interesting if in for the further research, uh, further research, if you can add another variable, which is the media's coverage during that period of time, and especially those most influential kind of media's coverage of that period of time, and correspond to whatever variable you have. And I, I think that will build up this complete loop in terms of where, not only the ideology, but also where the ideology come from. And also that, I think, corresponds to our today's kind of uh, conference title, which is uh, tinted uh, lens, or in some cases, maybe tinted uh, lens. Uh, so uh, I think that may be another kind of angle to look at this. Um, OK, uh, the, the, my comments regarding uh, Dr. Lin's uh, the kind of study. I think you provide a much needed uh, kind of review as to what the Chinese uh, uh, international uh, kind of relations uh, community in terms of their self-perception uh, and also their suggestion in terms of where China stands and also what kind of approach China should take uh, in a wide range of issues. Uh, so here, I think the, you didn't actually use the terminology uh, uh, from your paper, which uh, you actually group them together. One group is the realist. We have time. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, actually, you <laughs> pretty much can categorize them uh, into two groups. One group is uh, defined as realist, which is more kind of assertive, aggressive in their belief that China really kind of sent to a superpower status. Another group, uh, according to your definition, is rationalist 
which is more kind of a uh, self power kind of approach is more kind of a moderate. Uh, I, I, I know it's very difficult to find a, a very appropriate or accurate uh, this master concept really kind of uh, cover all these very diverse kind of discussion in, in China. But, but I, I think there's a little bit kind of ambiguous or even sometimes uh, confusion if you use the realist as if this is the group of people who per present this assertive kind of idea. And another group as the rationalist which present uh, uh, maybe a moderate uh, type of view because I think it's very easy you can find out even for the realist, so-called realist, you can find a lot of their kind of very rational discussion, okay, from their point of view. And also for the rationalist, you can find out actually it may be very realistic for China to adopt the current policy. So I think that may be, if you look deep into the divide between these two groups, I, I think that may fall well in line with the uh, traditional kind of discussion about the divide between the nationalist or internationalist or maybe using our American kind of terminologies, conservative or liberal, or maybe real politics uh, follower, or maybe some soft uh, kind, of, uh, uh, kind of approaches. Uh, so I think all in all, if you look at uh, the past 10 years, I think the most dominant policy taken by the administration can be defined as a moderate, pragmatic kind of approach. Worry, objective, worry, kind of uh, uh, conscious about the self-interest. So it's based on the self-interest rather than really driven by uh, ideology uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, talking points. I think that's maybe a uh, uh, kind of angle to look at. Uh, let's see. Okay, another thing is when you, when you mention this, uh, uh, the China's kind of assertive, uh, assert, uh, assertiveness, uh, you, I think in your paper you didn't really kind of provide a, a good background uh, uh, regarding the context of some of these assertive ideas. Because if you look at uh, carefully, uh, just by the turn, when the first uh, uh, Obama administration took power in uh, early 2009, actually that's the pivotal moment when the U.S. government changed their position toward Asia. Uh, especially from uh, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton uh, made several very powerful speech in terms U.S. should return to uh, the Pacific uh, kind of uh, uh, region and also pivot to Asia, especially try to counterbalance China. If you put a lot of this, the United States kind of step in terms of reinforcing their presence in China and with China's kind of assertive whatever their rhetoric, you will find out actually they're corresponding with each other uh, quite seamlessly. So I think from the Chinese part of point of view, they can make an argument actually is actually China's reaction is in reaction rather than proactive uh, to Americans returning their focus from the Middle East uh, to Asia. Uh, so I think from their point of view, it's also maybe a, a little bit kind of a logical thinking rather than really kind of aggressive or assertive uh, in that uh, respective. Uh, so I think to, to wrap up my kind of uh, my discussion about this, we always talk about uh, knowledge, and then from the knowledge we talk about uh, perception. And in this uh, regard, actually, it's U.S. and China's misperception of, of each other. But I would caution the most problematic problematic point of, or the obstacle between China and U.S. is not only the misperception of each other, because if you realize we misperceive the other part. There's still chance we can mend the fence. We can really, really kind of level the gap, okay, fill up the gap. I think the most uh, difficult part for both countries to really overcome the difficulty right now is we misperceive each other's misperception. <laughs> good. We, yeah, we know. We, we, all the Chinese officials, Chinese people know you don't understand us. And Americans say you don't understand me. But actually, if you look further into, okay, what I misunderstand you, we will find out actually we misunderstand people's or others' misunderstanding of us. So actually, the looking glass self effect, which we try to look at the mirror to find out where our image is, you will find out actually the image is installed in front of you is not a great or, or reliable kind of mirror. So I think that may be another part we can look at. Okay, thank you. My time.